Well, we are continuing our series, Being the Church. It's a study of 1 Corinthians. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church that he had planted, and he's teaching them, he's instructing them, he's responding some pro- to some problems he heard about them, and he does it through this letter. It's 1 Corinthians. It's not the first letter he ever wrote to them, but it's what we call 1 Corinthians. It's really the first authoritative, circular letter that means something to us in the modern age. Now, Paul had planted that church, and he left it, and he was living in Ephesus at the time. But he heard reports from the house of Chloe and others that there's divisions and quarrels and and, uh, uh, lots of trouble in this church that he needed to respond to. Now remember this, when he writes a letter to the church, he's writing to the ecclesia, that's the Greek word, the called out ones. And Peter says they're called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So these were called out of the world, called out of the way they were living and walking in the spirit of God. The church was operating in the spirit of God, but that doesn't mean that they had everything going well. In fact, there were quite a few problems. Now, in the first chapter, Paul's really complimentary. He was saying to them in 1 Corinthians 1, 5, and 7, you are enriched in every way with all kinds of speech, with all kinds of knowledge. You don't lack lack any spiritual gift. But here we see, and we'll see in other chapters going forward, that they are immature, they're very childish, and in in many ways, they are in constant need of correction. And there's a common misconception that says, if someone is knowledgeable in the word, or moving in the gifts, or you know, maybe the church is big, or they're articulate, or they're gifted, or whatever else it might be, that they're also very mature. And sadly, that's often not the case. In fact, sometimes we see leaders or churches with a high level of giftedness, and even success, if that's what church growth is, and they're not mature. They are operating in a childish way. There's lots of problems going on behind the scenes, and that's definitely the case with the Corinthian church, and Paul addresses it directly in this chapter. So let's jump right into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? (laughs) We'll get to that. But Paul initially uses the analogy of milk and meat. You know, milk, which is given to young children, young immature children, babies really, to help them grow past infancy into a level of maturity where they can actually start to digest solid food and and continue their growth, in this case, meat. Uh, But they can't grow in strength and stature and maturity and become fully developed just on milk. In fact, that'll stunt their growth. Sometimes a child's development can be severely stunted if they stay on milk too long and are not introduced to solid foods. We just watched a documentary on grizzly bears. (laughs) We just watched a documentary from National Geographic on grizzly bears from birth, actually before birth to birth to uh, the time the cubs start to grow up. And what's interesting is that cubs, these baby bears, they can eat salmon out of the river, which is their main staple for protein, at around six months. Six months old, they can actually be eating salmon. However, some will not do it. Some will just stay on milk from the mother for up to three years. And this is a problem because these cubs will not grow in size and maturity like those that are eating meat. In fact, they have an arrested development and they stay small and that affects their ability to survive and it makes them really vulnerable to other predators. In fact, you know, grizzly uh, bears actually, cubs actually have predators. You know, they stay more like teddy bears than grizzly bears. (laughs) And I see that in the church because we have predators. See, we live in a battle zone. There are spiritual predators all around us every day. Now, their main weapons are deception and division. That's really the, the weapon and the, and the strategy, deception and division. And it's not a problem for us because we are able to overcome those enemies if we're strong in the Lord. And if we're able to successfully and skillfully wield what Ephesians 6, 17 calls the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But if we remain weak and immature, 
because we just subsist on milk and we're not getting into the meat of the word? Well, we'll be like those teddy bears, not those grizzly bears. And, and we'll be extremely vul vulnerable to the enemy and he will come in and divide us and he will conquer us. He will have victory, I should say, in parts of our lives. And these Corinthians were experiencing that. They're, they're staying very immature. And Paul was making that known to them. That's why he said, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Are you not worldly? Are you not still acting like mere humans? I love that. Mere humans, what an insult. Other versions will say people of the world, of the world, ordinary people, carnal men, or just mere men. Mere humans, mere men, what does that mean? What is Paul trying to say? Simple. It means they're just acting like people who don't live by the Spirit. That's what he told them. You're acting like those who don't live by the Spirit and merely operating on the resources of the soul and the flesh, not the heart, which leads to the Spirit. So they're obviously acting in the flesh and not the Spirit. <laughs> they could, but they wouldn't. Have you ever flown on a private jet? I've had the opportunity to be a guest on a private jet a few times. It's very interesting, very different. You know, you, it's not like you go to the airport and you do the, go through the parking and the security and the baggage and the ticket desk and, and the gate agent and all that stuff. You basically just drive to wherever the airport it is. It's usually like a small airport near a larger airport. And you park your car and you get out and you, know, you grab your bag. And there's the pilot and the co-pilot just kind of welcoming you and you take your bag, put it into the cargo hold and everyone kind of gets in and, you know, it's like a giant minivan and the captain said, you guys ready to go? And yeah, let's go. And you know, okay, we're going to go. I don't know, maybe it's like a two hour flight to Orlando and before you know it, you're there. No check-in, no security, no take your shoes off and go through the scanner, none of that. So you get to see, however, how the pilot operates the jet. And that's really interesting. Now, what happens is the pilot, you know, taxis out to the runway and picks up enough speed and gets to a certain point where they can take off and pulls this lever from the control column, which activates these things called the elevator mechanisms and the plane goes up and the rest is history. But can you imagine if we did all that and we get into the plane, the pilot welcomes us and we get in and he taxis down the runway and you're ready to take off. And he decides to take, make a, a turn and go back towards the, the little terminal and the parking lot and then drives down the driveway of the parking lot, makes a left turn and goes down a road and ends up getting on the interstate. And you realize he's driving to your destination. And he says, guys, if we don't hit any traffic in Baltimore, you know, we'll be in Florida in 16 hours. And you think to yourself, crazy. <laughs> Doesn't he realize he just had to pop? <laughs> Let me tell you, a lot of us operate like that. I know it's comical, but a lot of us will not pull the lever and take flight. In other words, we operate in the flesh and not in the spirit. And that's what this Corinthian church is doing. They're operating in their own resources and not living by the spirit. And you could tell because their jealousy and their quarreling and their divisiveness was not of the spirit. It was of the flesh and it was just destroying the church. If they were living by the spirit, they could overcome these conflicts, overcome and not be entangled by the crazy stuff that's happening in the world. James 3, 14 and 15 says this, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. Those are James' words, not mine. But he's saying, false to the truth, not the wisdom that comes from above. And here's what that means. They just, it describes those who, those who may know the truth of God's word, but are not living it. So they're not being true to the truth. They're being false to the truth, is what it just says. So once again, the Corinthian church, we see later in the epistles that they're you know, sometimes operating in the spirit. But most of the time, what we see here is they're operating in the flesh. They're not, they may know the scriptures, and you know a lot of people that know the Bible. Maybe they even know about the Bible. Maybe they've memorized the Bible, but they're not operating it. They're not doing what it says. When the, when the Bible says walk in the spirit, they're not walking in the spirit. They're like that 
<laughs> that pilot that tries to drive the jet to Florida. James 1.22 says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. Don't just be hearers, but be doers of the word. And I would add, he said, do not merely listen to the world, do not merely listen to the word, do what it says. I would say, do not merely study the word, do what it says. Do not merely agree with the word, do what it says. Do not merely memorize the word, do what it says. Do not merely sing about the word, do what it says. And how about this? Do not merely follow people who teach the word, but do what it says. Listen to it yourself, internalize it. And when it says to operate in the spirit, when it says to walk in the spirit, when it says to pursue God and worship him in spirit and truth, do that. Verse four says, for one says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos? And what after all is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God is the one that's making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-laborers in God's service, but you are God's field, God's building. You see, we do all the stuff, but God is the one that makes it grow, and we are co-laborers in God's service. He says, I planted, Apollos watered. Only God makes things grow. See, Paul's explaining how he planted this church in Corinth in the first place. And then he planted it and he went on to Ephesus and God uh, provided Apollos to come along and water it. That means kind of tend it and cultivate it. But they're not in competition with each other. They're co-laborers together, Apollos and Paul. You know who Apollos is, you may not know. He was a highly respected Christian from Alexandria. Uh, he was fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught eloquently and accurately the things concerning Jesus. Um, and he was, a, he was actually used to establish that church in, in Ephesus. And Paul came to Ephesus. You know, it's interesting because Paul went to Ephesus. He left Corinth, went to Ephesus. And uh, Apollos left Ephesus and went to Corinth. They sort of switched places. Acts 19.1 says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through in the interior and, dropped, and went to Ephesus. So they kind of switch places. You see, all of us are believers in the Lord Jesus. And, and those who believe in him and are called according to his purpose, we're on one team. We're not competing against each other. We may have different roles at different times. Maybe we have the same role at the same time or different role, same role at different times. But we're all working together. And I'm not just talking about leaders. I'm talking about entire churches. And I'm not just talking about churches. I'm talking about individuals. I'm talking about you and me. We're co-laborers, not competitors. It, it blesses my heart when I am able to co-labor with other churches in the area for the purposes of the kingdom of God in this area. And we do that a lot. And because it's the kingdom of God. Now listen, we may not all agree on stuff. We may not agree on every method or point of doctrine, but that doesn't stop us from co-laboring for the kingdom work in this area. And how about you know, once in a while, I'll have a, a, someone come to our church and, and enjoy the church and say, I was sent here from another pastor because it's closer or because they know that your church will serve my needs better. How about that? Not hoarding people, even though they're dying on the vine in our church. You know, God forbid we let them go to another church. Uh, when that, when that, the opposite of that happens, it blesses me. It blesses the heart of God. Verse 10, let's pick it up. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light, it will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. For if it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, yet he will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. You know, gold, silver, and precious stones, costly stones, they can 
absorb heat, they can withstand the flames, but not so with wood, hay, or straw. And gold, precious stones, and silver are the word of God. And everything else is representative of just things that are not. The only thing that will last are things that are built upon the word of God. But what Paul is saying here is we're all working on the same building. He said the foundation of that building, well, that's already laid. Verse 11, no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. So we build on that foundation using what we are given by the Holy Spirit. And in any part of him that, will, that is with him, in him will last, and what is not of him will not last. And, the, and that's how the, word, the church is built together. See, comparing this to a building. Uh, the people of Corinth and Ephesus and Athens, which is the next city down, they understood buildings. This analogy probably really spoke to them because the idea of building something uh, was, you know, not anything new. They, they have lived among some of the greatest structures and edifices in the ancient world, the most impressive buildings in the ancient world. I'm talking about the temples. Uh, in Corinth, you have the Temple of Apollo. In Ephesus, you have the Temple of Artemis. And in Athens... <laughs> You have the Parthenon, amongst other temples at the Areopagus. And those who have traveled to Jerusalem, of which there were probably many, well, they would have seen the recently renovated temple in Jerusalem, the temple, which was just renovated under Herod the Great and became a colossal structure. Uh, and, and this is the temple that the Holy of Holies existed in. It was the temple that God, really, that he dwelt in, in the Holy of Holies. However... Not anymore, because when Jesus died on the cross, that, that Holy of Holies was rendered inoperative because the veil of the temple was ripped in half from top to bottom. And, you know, we see that in Acts 17, 24, it says God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So he doesn't dwell in the temple anymore. In fact, that temple in Jerusalem, as great as it was, through the colossal renovation, restructuring really, by um, Herod, it was destroyed about 15 years later um, by the Romans in 70 AD. So that didn't even last. So what happened then? Think about that. If God doesn't dwell in the temple, if the temple's destroyed, what happens? Where does he dwell? Remember the prophecy in, in the second chapter of Acts when Peter was pulling from the prophecy, explaining what's going on. You know, you have Acts and the Pentecost has taken place and amazing miracles of the tongues and the fire and the language and the wind and all this kind of stuff. And people are like, wow, these, you guys must be drunk. This is crazy. And Peter stood up and he drew from a scripture in Joel 2 to explain what was going on. That will answer where the Spirit of God dwells now. Acts 2, 14 through 18 says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes, And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your men shall see visions. Your young men, your old men shall dream dreams. And my men servants and my, my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. You see, God didn't simply pour out his spirit onto a temple. He didn't even pour out his spirit just randomly on the earth, onto the ground, onto the trees, into the forest, into the woods, into the waters. He didn't pour out his spirit on buildings. He didn't pour out his spirit on specific houses or synagogues. He doesn't do that. Titus 3.6 says he generously poured out his spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are the temple. That's why the next verse says in our text, verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. You see, a building is not a temple. You know, I don't know if you've ever gone into a church by yourself midweek in the dark or whatever. Sunday morning when it's filled with 
people who are worshiping the Lord and those people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, it seems like that building, that sanctuary, that auditorium, whatever it is, is filled with the Holy Spirit. But when there's nobody there, that building is not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just a building. God doesn't dwell in buildings. He doesn't dwell in, you know, a room. He doesn't dwell in cars. You can't put him in your car. You can't put him in a shoebox. You can't say this shoebox is filled with the Holy Spirit. He pours his spirit on us, on all flesh, those who believe. That's how we receive, and that's who we are, the containers of the temples of the Holy Spirit. Verse 18 says this, Do not deceive yourself. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apostle or Cephas, which is Peter, or the word of life or death or the present or the future are all yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. This is a beautiful way to end this chapter because in as much as he was rebuking them and correcting them for acting like, you know, God forbid, mere humans, Paul was also being very forthright and encouraging and reminding them of who they are when they're in Christ. You are God's field, God's building, he said. He told them, you yourself are God's temple. God dwells in you, in verse 16. And in verse 23, we just read, you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Okay, so what about us? If Paul was writing his letter to us, to our church, or to us as individuals, would he write the same rebuke that he started with? Would he write, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Aren't you not worldly? You're not, because you're now acting like mere humans. See, he would write that if we were acting like real humans, if we were ignoring the Spirit of God, if we were pursuing worldly wisdom and human reasoning and false arguments over the wisdom of God. But not if we were being doers of the word. Not if we were not just being hearers, but we were actually walking in the spirit and not pursuing the things of the flesh. But if we were quarreling and fighting and living you know, in, in opposition to one another, biting and devouring one another, as this next verse will say, it's clearly living by the, by the flesh, not by the spirit. Let's read Galatians 5, 15 through 17. It says this, If you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, here's where it goes, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another so that you are not to do whatever you want. Simply put, walk by the Spirit and watch what happens. Now you don't have to kind of be... I know some of us are obsessed about not walking by the flesh. I don't want to do that. That's of the flesh. I'm going to, you know, abstain from that. That's of the flesh. I'm going to fast from that. That's of the flesh. I'm going to kick this habit. I'm going to modify this behavior. It's of the flesh. All you're working on is the flesh. But what Paul is saying here is walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit and watch what happens. Well, you know what will happen? You'll stop gratifying the things of the flesh. They, they simply fade away when you're fervently pursuing the Spirit. In other words, live by the Spirit, not as mere humans. Now, we are human. We don't, but even though we are human, we don't live the way normal humans do. We live by the Spirit. We worship God that way. We treat each other differently. We engage the world differently if we operate in the Spirit. And you know what? We operate in the Spirit in spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5 says this. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So, my friends, we are in a warfare. We do have an adversary. We do have those that want to rip us apart and divide us and deceive us. There are spiritual predators out there that just want to destroy us. So what do we do? We live by the Spirit. We wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We make a fresh commitment in this brand new season to 
live and walk in the Spirit of God. Because living in the Spirit gives us victory. You know what else? Living by the Spirit means that we will enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. All that good stuff. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness. All that stuff. Living by the Spirit means we will operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Word of knowledge, prophecy, you know, words of wisdom, other gifts that God will give us. Living by the Spirit means that we'll have a clear understanding of what is of the Spirit and what is not of the Spirit. Discernment to accurately identify the deceptive schemes of the enemy. You know, if you could actively, accurately identify the traps that are set before you, well, you have a much better chance of avoiding them and that you can do by walking in the Spirit. But if you're walking in the flesh, there'll be bear traps <laughs> all the way along. And then lastly, if we live by the Spirit, that means we will be victorious through the power of the Spirit in the warfare every day. And if we don't, we're likely to be defeated and live a defeated life. So what's it going to be? Living by the Spirit or living according to the flesh? Living by the Spirit, the Word of God, devouring the meat of, the God, of, of God and, and, and growing and cultivating and maturing? Or staying as vulnerable babies but just drinking the milk of the Word? My challenge to you and to me is let's Walk by the Spirit and also live in the Spirit every day of this brand new year. And watch what happens. God bless you.